Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all your faces. I hear y'all had a wonderful time Friday night. Is that correct? Look, I, I've heard nothing but great things about it. All your pictures online are fantastic, and so I was, I was glad to see y'all had that opportunity to do that. We miss it. We're still back in Louisiana trying to get everything squared away with our home and kind of get everybody transitioned over here. So if you'll be praying for my wife and my family and I as we continue to kind of live apart for a few weeks while we get everything sold, that would be fantastic. Another thing I'd love for you to pray for uh, is if you would be praying for our VBS this coming week. We've got kids signed up, and we've got people who are in place ready to lead those kids throughout the course of this week. And we want them to have the greatest time this week. But most of all, we want them to encounter Jesus. And so if you'd be praying for those kids and the decisions that they could possibly make and for the lessons that they'll be taught during the course of this week, that would be fantastic. If you take a, a look at your bulletin real quick, I just want to point out a couple of things to you. Well, look, I'm just wrong. I am so sorry. Next week. So we won't pray for it until next week. We'll just do that. We'll just hold off. Go ahead and pray for it. We'll be fine. We'll be good. All right. We'll go. But go ahead and take a look at your, your bulletin. I do want to point out a couple things to you. Uh, VBS, obviously, would be August 3rd through the 5th. That's what I just said. And then the, we'll be starting a parenting class on September um, 12th. And this class is going to be designed to, to help us to reach some of the uh, younger adults in our community who are bringing up teens and preteens. And, and they, they don't know how to have conversations with their kids about certain issues. or They've, they've never had the, uh, the opportunity to sit down and na navigate through Scripture with their kid. And so we're going to have the opportunity to sit and, and visit with them through the 20-plus uh, years of student ministry that my wife and I have been involved with and working with families. We're going to have the opportunity to teach that class, and we're looking forward to it. And here's, the, here's how you can help us with that, because most of you have already raised your kids. And so here's what, here's what you can do. You've got people in your neighborhood who might know about it, who, who might need this class. And so if you would share that on Facebook, uh, share that with your friends, take this bulletin and say, hey, look, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I think this would be an interesting class. Help us to get as many people signed up for that class as possible. It will help us to, uh, to really reach that, that uh, demographic of people, and, and uh, we're, we're really wanting to do that and give them an, uh, an opportunity to do that. While they are in that class, their, their students will have an opportunity to go to the high school ministry and the junior high ministry, and so it'll, it'll be good for everybody. So we're looking forward to everything that's about to happen this, 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 uh, this morning. We think it's going to be the best hour of your week. And one of the things that we think is going to be the, even the best thing is the next step that the uh, people are taking in the baptistry behind us. Uh, we, I think we've got maybe two people this morning or one or two people this morning that are about to be baptized by Pastor Kerry. And so we want to turn our attention there, and then we're going to jump into worship right after that is over. So let's, 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 let's look. One of the greatest joys that I have is getting to baptize. And Jimmy Haney, one of our men, been coming here a long time, he said, minute he walked into this church he knew he was at home well it took him a, a little bit of time and then he realized what he really needed was the Lord not just a church and so he gave his life to the Lord uh, it's it's been a while we got hit by COVID and everything else we we haven't been able to have the baptism so now we're ready and so we're finally getting to to come and do this so Jimmy come on down There you go. We had to refill the tub a while ago. Leon's right here. Uh, we had to refill it because it was, water had drained out. And I was going to do my first splash baptism. <laughs> Sit him down and just kind of... <laughs> splash it up so we got it we got it a little bit fuller so that's kind of what we're trying to do is work all those things down so Jimmy based upon the public profession of faith that you made in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord I baptize you my brother in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit let go of that hold on almost almost a little bit more a little bit more there you go all right all right thank you there you go. There you go. All right. First word out of the tub was, thank you, Lord. What a deal. All right. Choir, y'all come on up. Come on up.
Today's going to be kind of a confession day for me. Uh, normally, before I come up here and have the opportunity to pray with you all, I pray and ask God what he'd have laid on my heart that I should say. And about a month ago, before I came up here, he did, and I didn't. And, sorry, it's going to be tough. Amen. Um, he laid on my heart uh, last month that the church that we, I'm sorry, I'm shaking, guys. This is tough. Um, the uh, church that we used to attend, we would have, it was a Baptist church, and we had an altar call every Sunday. And there was a gentleman at our church, big church, that always sat way back in the back, back there where Gary is. And when the pastor would say something and that would merit an amen, this guy's voice would just boom throughout the entire church. Amen. And he was one of these guys that whenever the church doors were open, uh, he was there. He served on the parking lot committee. He was an usher. He was asked several times to be a deacon, to serve as a deacon in the church. I feel like I'm trembling. <laughs> this is terrible. Um, but he always turned down the deacon opportunity, and that's fine, because if you're not called to serve in that capacity, that's, uh, that's okay. One Sunday, we had the altar call. And this guy's late 70s, pushing 80. And down the hall, down the aisle, he walks forward to receive Jesus. Amen. Now, we had been around this guy for years and years and years. Everybody in this church knew him. Everybody assumed that he'd receive Jesus. Everybody assumed they were going to spend eternity with this guy. What I'm, God's laid on my heart today to pray to you guys, and like I say, he did last, last Sunday. There's somebody in this room today that has not accepted Jesus Christ. And I love each and every one of you, and I want to spend eternity with you. But unless you do, I'm sorry. I won't be able to. So my prayer today is that this will be the day that, don't be ashamed, guys, don't be embarrassed. We're talking about your eternity. Sorry. So my prayer today is going to be that, that you will hear my voice, that you will hear the voice of God coming through me. And today, you will make that decision. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Forgive me for not being obedient to you. And my prayer today is that person that you wanted me to speak to a month ago is still with us and that that opportunity hasn't been lost and that today they will accept that and they will accept you under their heart, accept your love and your grace that you so freely give. In Christ Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you, everybody, for taking us to the throne. Very good. Thank you for that. There was a pastor whose wife always helped him time out his messages. She did it by giving him a mint to put in his mouth right before he went up to speak so that when he noticed the mint was gone, it was time to stop. One day he kept going and going and going, and she looked, and there's the mint sitting in her hand, and she realized she'd given him a button. (laughs) You may think I've got a button in me today. I hope not. You know, if you're like me, uh, oh, if there are any kids that are ready to go to children's church, uh, go out that way. Meet, meet with the guy in the blue back there and, and go that direction. I think you already probably have them. Thanks, sir. The, uh, if you're like me, you probably work off of to-do lists. Uh, to-do lists are very handy. You know, we sit around, we, we kind of figure out what we want to do. We mark it down, and then when we've accomplished that, we scratch it off. And it's a great feeling to be able to see the things on the list go away. Most of the time, we do our own to-do lists. Sometimes, someone does them for us, and we work their agenda, not ours. Well, setting goals is basically what a to-do list is. You're setting a goal for things I want to accomplish. And setting goals is a great way to get things done. Uh, The goal is marked for us, and so the measure is, did we accomplish it? And if we can say yes, we we scratch it off. Well, in September the 12th, 1962, President Kennedy gave us a goal as a nation. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we're unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. The goal was going to the moon. The moon was the goal. And from that moment on, that was the determined plan of the United States until on July the 16th. 1969, the eagle landed, tranquility sea, and there we were. We had made it to the moon. But even with the setting of that goal, basically it was an impossible idea. Without coming back and taking that goal and then putting it into incremental steps that we would be able to go through one after another in order to get to the ultimate goal. There were a lot of steps involved. A lot of sequences that had to click off for that to be able to happen. Now, realize where we were in history the moment he made that speech in 1962. Just a year before that, Alan Shepard was our first guy that we sent up. About five months before this speech, uh, what's his name? Uh, (laughs) The other guy, John Glenn, thank you. John Glenn went up and orbited the earth. That's as far as we had gotten. That's as far as we had gotten in in this this thing of, of going up into space. And so you look at that and you basically say the goal of landing on the moon by all measurements that could be used was like eating an elephant. How are we going to devour this huge thing? And so the decision was we'll take one bite at a time. And the more bites we can take, eventually we will consume that elephant. We will have reached our goal. Well, I was taught to set goals along the way. It's a, it's a great tool to help keep us on track. Make sure that we know we're going in the right direction. Uh, not only do they let us know when the job is done, which is kind of important there, but they also give us a sense of accomplishment. There's something special about scratching something off that you've done. You're finished, completed, and can move on. But goals are primarily tasks driven by a purpose. Now, the engineers didn't need to know the purpose of going to the moon. The engineers were more interested in, tell me what you want and when you want it. 
And that's all they worked from. We'll accomplish our part of the goals. We don't need to know why we're doing this. But for most of us, we want to know what's behind it. Why are we doing this in the first place? Uh, What was our purpose going to the moon? Well, if you'll think back, you'll remember we were in a space race with Russia. We We were challenging them and they were challenging us to different steps of the process of getting there into outer space. They had already sent a man up before we were, we were still sending monkeys up. They had already had a man uh, step out of his spacecraft before we'd ever gone up in a spacecraft. There were a lot of things they were doing that was just ahead of us, and it was so frustrating that it became a, a, a pressing desire to somehow do something that would get us on the map first, and that was it. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to be the first ones that go there, and we're going to be able to from that moment on, say, we have won the space race. Now, that was our why, the, 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 the battle over Russia, who got there. Uh, a goal is simply a what. It, it's going to require a how and a when, but the why is our reason. It's the justification for staying on track and accomplishing the mission. Now, when Israel had left Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land, Uh, They had a goal. The goal was, let's go to the promised land. Let's leave Egypt and go to the promised land. They never understood the reason Moses was leading them there. And honestly, they didn't care about the reason. They didn't want to know why. They just wanted to know, are we getting out of Egypt? Are we going into the the promised land? So for them, uh, that whole thing was just a relocation project. Take us out of Egypt, get us into the, the promised land. But, but God, behind that uh, goal, was actually working out a, a plan. In other words, God was the one with the purpose. Uh, Moses wasn't. Moses was given a mission. Go get the people, take them into the promised land. Got it. Here we go. God held the purpose over the mission. God had the reason why he was doing that in the first place. Uh, The people didn't grasp that. That's why when God began to reshape them into something that would reflect his people, that they were now his people and not just a group of people that were moving from one location to another, that's where the rub came into the story. That's where they started challenging God for the right to take them and remake them into something that they weren't sure they wanted to be. They were okay with the goal, but they rejected God's purpose over that goal. But you see, if if getting to the promised land was all that God had in mind, it didn't matter what they became. It didn't matter that they began to live in a way that reflected how great God was because that that simply was not a part of what was going on. If it was simply to get them from point A to point B, you don't have to change lives to be able to do that. But when God began to do that and realized that his purpose there was a destination of life change, adjusting to that life was essential. Last night... Jen and I watched for about that long a uh, documentary, and I was afraid of it from, from the start, and don't get me started. Uh, it was produced by CNN, and it was about Jerusalem. I wanted to see it because I love Jerusalem, and we're going there again this next year, so I wanted to see that. Well, what they did, they drew in all of these religion professors from a variety of secular universities and allowed them to discuss this perspective of God establishing a place for his people. And the one thing that was left out, totally, was a purpose. All they dealt with was how and why. What battle got them what ground? What man led them to do these things? What was this guy up to and why did they follow after him? There was nothing in there about this being God's people that he had taken out of Egypt, reshaped them to live according to his design, and then moved them into a place that they were to occupy. It was totally the opposite. It was these people invaded a land that belonged to someone else, and they are guilty for having done so. Turned it off. 
couldn't, couldn't watch it any longer. Because that mindset is what the people that left out of Egypt carried with them. We just want to go from point A to point B. We're not interested in becoming the people of God. And as a result from that, God had to do some rather harsh things along the way to change that perspective. You see, they, they didn't know what it meant to be the people of God. And so when God started interjecting that into their lives, they began to push back. So to keep from overwhelming them, God didn't show them his purpose until much later in the journey. He started with the foundational principle, you must learn to obey me. From there, everything went on. There was a, a sea captain who had uh, gotten his crew out on the deck and said, guys, it is very important for you to know this. When I give you an order, you are to obey that order instantly. If not, it could cause your death. One day, they were out on the deck, and a cable, steel cable that was holding up the sail began to unravel, and he could see it's fixing to snap. When it does, it's just going to start slinging around. It's going to slice people to death. So he yelled out as loud as he could, hit the deck. Every man instantly, without asking why, hit the deck. And that cable spun right above their heads. You see, God understands that there are things that are going to come down the road that he can't give us warning about before they get there. He needs to have us so well in tune with him so that whenever he says, I need you to move, you move. I need you to stop, you stop. I need you to jump. You don't ask me anything, you just jump. Because I know what's best in those moments. Well, here's, here's what Jeremiah wrote from the Lord, Jeremiah 7. I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God. You will be my people and you will walk in all the way which I command you that it may be well with you. See, when God immediately brought them out, he couldn't lay on them this whole picture of what was going to happen when they got to the, the promised land. He couldn't explain to them all the details of things he needed them to know. So he just started with the basics. He just started with, I need you to understand this one principle. Whatever I say goes, obey my voice. And then he gave them a promise attached to it. If you do, it'll go well with you. And so that was the command. Now, that's called progressive revelation, where God has something he wants us to know, but we can't handle it yet. So he gives us a little piece at a time until he moves us far along in our growth to where now I can understand and grasp that. I couldn't have handled it before. I couldn't have understood it before. But I went through these experiences. Now I know what he's talking about, progressive revelation. Uh, it started with step one. Let's get out of Egypt and let's head toward the promised land. Leaving Egypt, along the way you'll learn who I am and what I can do. I'll open the sea for you so you can walk through it. I'll feed you with the bread of heaven to keep you alive and sustain. I'll give you a cloud in the daytime and I'll give you fire at night to show you which way to go. I'll defeat your enemies for you. Now another step, we're going to go to Mount Sinai where I'm going to tell you how I want you to live. I want you to get a, a list of commandments that you'll start learning and, and practicing. And there'll be simple instructions for you to know things you should do, things you shouldn't do. Then you'll learn a new way of doing worship. I'll give you instructions about a sacrificial system. And then you'll need some general rules to know how to live together as my people, so I'll give you my law. You see, that was the, the journey to the moon for these folks. We can't get here, there from here. It's an elephant. We can't eat this. So God says, great, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with bite number one, obey me. Now, let's take bite number two. Let's start making some adjustments to me. Bite number three, until eventually God was helping them eat that huge elephant of the, of the purposes that he had laid out for them and was moving them closer to that identity as being the people of God. 
You see, that's why learning obedience as a, as a believer is the first step to any other growth as a Christian. You, you, don't, you don't start with trying to figure out Revelation. You don't, you don't start with trying to understand all the books of the Bible and the things that go on. You start from the standpoint of, you are my God and I obey you. And now we begin to move forward. That's what they were having to learn and that was the responsibility. To accept an open-ended right for God to rule. I don't question him. I don't come back and ask why. I just simply obey and move forward. Which, which meant it was their responsibility to hook up to his train. He was pulling this train in a, in a purposeful way, going somewhere, and we may not even know where, but we're going to hook up to that train and go along with him. And in doing so, understand that it'll be well with us. That 40-year experience in the desert served uh, several purposes. Uh, the first one, honestly, was to weed out those that had no ability or desire to obey him. Those that grumbled, those that complained, those that had a better idea. And God took 40 years to kind of weed those out. And then he took the rest of the time to, to get Egypt out of the rest of them that remained. To change their mindset from, from being an Egyptian Jew just to be a Jew. Somebody who loves the Lord and follows after him. It was a sequence. It was a matter of getting them out getting that out of them, and then pouring into them an understanding of, of what they were to become. Now, some people ask, well, why would God be so harsh? Uh, why didn't he just let them alone, just let them go to this new land and live there, be whatever they want to be, just have a great time? He delivered them out of Egypt. Why didn't he just let them live however they want to? Because that's not how God operates. That's, that's called not being in our best interest you know there's a uh well I, I don't know it's a twisted truth we'll call it that where people say well god loves me and and he doesn't care how i live well part of that is true god does love us but he does care how we live in fact he finds us as we are and then he begins to mold us into what we can be in him he loves us too much to leave us like he found us and so here in this moment you realize that that whenever we expect the love of God to ignore our behavior we've misunderstood the holiness of God whenever we want a God of mercy and not a God of judgment we've misunderstood the righteousness of God Whenever we want a God of truth and not a God of accountability for that truth, we misunderstood the character of God. You see, we have to understand that we're on a mission toward a goal that is included within a purpose God has designed for us. And it's a progressive thing. I'm this, this, this far in my journey. i got a long way to go before this thing is over. The purpose is still established. The purpose is going to carry me through. The goals adjust according to what's happening in my life, but I've got a purpose that God is taking me on that's going to carry me to the very end of this. Paul said, I, I haven't achieved yet, or I haven't uh, uh, um, arrived yet at why God saved me, but I keep pressing on. In other words, I, I know there's a purpose behind this. I'm not there yet. So I'm going to keep after that until I finally realize what it is God had in mind when all of this started from the very beginning. Uh, Hebrews 12.5 says, uh, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. He disciplines us for our own good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Again, that's God saying, I love you too much to leave you like you were when I found you. I, I love you so much, I want to clean you up a little bit. 
I want to take some things out of your life that are hurting you. I want to put some things into your life that will bless you. I cannot just leave you like you are. I've got to make a difference in your life. Which is where the purpose of God comes from for us. The same purpose that he had over Israel to turn them into the people of God. That purpose is over us. What's a child of God look like? I don't know. But I know every day he is working in my life to help me look more like that than I was yesterday. He's continuing a process to reshape and reconfigure so that I will look more like what a child of God is supposed to look like. Uh, I, there are some universal steps that all of us are going to go through that are very consistent. First of all, God's going to make us holy. And then he's going to establish godliness as a foundational characteristic of our lives. He's going to want us to produce fruit of righteousness that shows the world his goodness working through us. Uh, he's wanting to infill us with a spirit whereby we demonstrate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He wants to gift us and call us into his service. See, that's all of us. That's every one of us. He's doing all of that. That's how he shapes people into being children of God. Now some, when he gets down to some specifics, he may have a little different path some of us have to take. Takes us on a journey that's, that's kind of more unique to who we are and what he wants to accomplish from us. But all of us will go through these steps, these steps in the process of being shaped into the people of God. And then there's that change factor that he wants us to accept and adopt as a principle of our life reorienting our wills to accept what it is that he wants us to do it's called repentance you know when I grew up repentance was saying you're sorry oh I repent I'm so sorry I did that no repentance the word means change the direction you're going one way if I repent, I'm going to change and go another way. Listen to that in these two verses, 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus died for all so that they who live may, not, may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. All right, I'm, I'm going down here. I'm living for myself. Jesus died so that I would not any longer live for myself, but I would live for him. I just repented right there. I turned the direction of my life toward him. Romans 6, 4. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. I'm walking along in an old life. And all of a sudden I hear this voice of God saying, let's go another direction. I turn and I'm going to walk in newness of life toward him. I repented right there. I turned my life. See, that's got to be one of the steps that we get built into our lives. First is obey Him. Period. The second is to repent. Every time I find out I'm going the wrong direction from the direction my God wants me to go. And I may tell Him, God, I'm sorry I have gone this direction. That may be a part of my confession. But He wants to see the literal turn of my life to redirect it toward Him. So I build into my life these two principles that are going to help me in every other thing I'm required to do. I obey Him. I change the direction of my life when I am so confronted by Him that I'm going the wrong way. See, the result is a life that reveals to us and anybody else our Father in heaven. And you say, wait a minute. I thought getting us to heaven was the whole purpose of all of this that God was doing. No, it's not. That's the same thing that the Israelites thought when they left Egypt. The only purpose God has is to get us into the promised land. What about that life change? What about all that God was going to do to form them into his people? What about us? If all God was interested in is getting us to heaven, it really would be to our advantage for him to take us on right then and not make us have to spend the rest of our life going through this stuff. Just zip us out of here and let us go. He leaves us here so that he can fashion us into children of God. So he's got a purpose beyond the goal of just getting us to come to know him or getting us into heaven. 
uh, in our study last week, we noted this, that we are engaged in a struggle between the urge to determine life for ourselves and surrendering to his right to rule. The lie that we can do a better job than he can in running our lives remains hidden in our hearts and must daily be denied room in our minds. That means that there is probably conflict brought into our life to show us that our lives are not surrendered to his will and doing things his way. You see, that, that's what went on in that 40-year uh, period to expose the resistance in the heart of those that came out of Egypt that were not going to be sensitive to God changing their lives, and he does the same thing to us. Every temptation, every test, every trial, every turmoil is an opportunity to adjust ourselves to God's purpose. Coming back, repenting, God, I, I've gone away from you, I'm going to come back and come back in this direction. These tribulations are crossroads Expo um, uh, where we must decide which direction we go. Will we exercise faith and follow God, or we will, will we revert to our old way of depending on ourselves with no regard for what God wants? I looked this up this week, found it interesting, fascinating. I never could find a number, but I found out there were many times in Apollo 11's trip to the moon that they had to make course corrections they started out I, we're going to the moon and they're headed that way but all along that way the computers on that in that capsule the men sitting in in houston working the things from there kept making minor adjustments to keep them on track do you realize that's what god's doing to us Making, making little adjustments. And how does he do that? Usually by bringing things into our life that get our attention to show us what we need to see. Listen to this, uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Therefore, Paul said, I run in such a way, not without aim. I box in such a way as not just beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now, what, what keeps someone in the race or in the ring or in the realm of God's purpose? Staying on track. Now, a while ago, we said that our idea that we were to follow was that we want to hook ourselves to God's train and go in the direction that, that he's leading us. And if we do that, we are not wanting to be derailed by obstacles or hindrances or weariness. You see, a train is designed to stay on the tracks, to run on the rails. Many things can interfere with that, and if they do, that train can be derailed. You know what the number one cause of derailment is? It's the tracks breaking down. Either they have broken the, the wells or the, the, the uh, wood, whatever that's called, that they're sitting on uh, begins to deteriorate or a nail pops up. But something has happened with the track itself and caused the train to derail. You know what the second most common cause of derailment? The wheel bearings wearing out. You, you see, the wheel bearings... Well, even the track itself, but the wheel bearings wearing out it is basically caused by the friction of that train operating across the tracks. Now, you've got friction in your life. I've got friction in my life from a variety of sources. And that friction can cause so much heat and so much damage to us, it can begin to wear us down. Uh, weariness has no age limit. Uh, you can get weary in your 20s just like you can in your 80s. We can get weary when things weigh us down, wear us out, or grind us up. We get worn down by friction of life and often choose to give up. Thomas Edison said, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is to always try just one more time. Why do people give up? Well, according to what David said, Psalm 6-6, I'm weary with my sign. 
Every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with tears. My eye is wasted away with grief. It has become old because of my adversaries. What David basically says is I am beginning to get tired of all I'm dealing with. And it's making me feel old. Do you, do you know what makes us feel old? It's not our age. It's weariness. Weariness. Extreme tiredness. Fatigue. Exhausted in strength. Endurance, vigor, or freshness. Reluctance to see or experience any more of something. The state of being tired of something because you've experienced too much of it. Life grinds us down. And we can say, hey, I'm t I can't do this anymore. And we begin to want to back away, drop out, give up. When, when we were living in uh, Brownwood early days, um, I was trying to find a job. I went to the turkey plant. <clears throat> Thought I could maybe get a job there. Went in and the guy said, yeah, come on in. Well, do I need to go change? No, we'll give you an apron. Put an apron on me. Took me into an assembly line of taking dead turkeys and stuffing them in a bag and sending them on down. One hour later, I was so weary I could not stuff another turkey in a bag. <laughs> had nothing to do with the turkey. Had nothing to do with the bag. It was not physically tiring. It was the weariness of I cannot spend my life doing this job. And I gave them an hour free. I never made them pay me. I just went into the bathroom, changed, and left that place. But I became weary because that was so mundane, I couldn't stand it anymore. Sometimes what we go through makes us weary. What, what are some of those things? Number one, there's too much going on in our lives. We're just overloaded, uh, worn down. Physically, we can only carry so much. Did you know emotionally you can only carry so much? And yet we still try to pour more and more on us. And sometimes it's like the, the, the wearing down of rocks in a stream, gradually just wearing the edges off of those. Sometimes it's like the washout of a flood coming through when all of a sudden we face a crisis and there goes our life down the, 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 the riverbed there. Uh, sometimes it's a lack of discipline. We, we might have to face this. No one cares, so why should I? Do you know there's no one checking on you to see if you're reading your Bible regularly? There's no one asking you, are you praying daily? There's no one looking at your life and saying, does your life match what the Bible says a child of God ought to? We have no accountability. And so often because there's no accountability, we let it slip. Because no one cares, so why should we? Another issue is we have a refusal to take responsibility for our own growth as children of God. You know, it's, it's okay for a baby to need to be fed. It's usually a tragedy when an adult has to be fed. You see, there, there's supposed to be this handoff in life where I don't need to sit and absorb anymore. I need to go in here and learn it for myself. And I need to start sharing that. Hebrews 5, 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles, the oracles of God. You come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That's how God designed it. That there would be a point in my life that I said, you know, I think I need to study this myself. And I need to start learning myself and not just always sit and absorb. And then there are those that look at the wrong standard. Sometimes we get more concerned about what others think than what God thinks. And we allow that to influence us in our behavior, our attitudes, how we're going to go through life and the things that we do. Another is trying to get better results with the same tactics. Uh, last week, we had uh, Reeve, our uh, grandson, in. Uh, great kid, fun kid to be around. But I listened to a conversation he was having with his little sister. 
and he was trying to explain something to her. She didn't get it. He said these certain, a certain set of words. This was his sentence. And she said something else. Obviously, she didn't. So he repeated this same sentence. She still didn't get it. So he repeated the same sentence. And she did three times. He repeated the same sentence, but she didn't get it. If the words I'm using don't get the understanding I'm expecting, I need to change my words. Well... If my actions aren't getting the same results in my life I'm wanting, I need to change my actions. If, if I'm going through the, the process, I'm cycling through under my normal habits, and those aren't getting me what I believe is really possible in my walk with the Lord, in my ability to endure, in the strength that I need for what I face, I may want to change some of my tactics. And then this last one, uh, often uh, we, we get weary because we really don't believe in what God has made possible to us. Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, why did he tell us that? Because he knew life is hard, and we're going to need some help. And so he made himself available as our help to deal with the weariness of life. Writer of Hebrews said this, Consider him, Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. New Living Translation said, so you won't become weary and give up. You see, that, that's our answer to the weariness of life. And why are we dealing with weariness? Because weariness is the number one cause of getting off track following after the Lord. We want to stop. We want to take a detour. We don't want to do this anymore. We want to do something else. That weariness is grinding away at the wheels of our life. And so Jesus said, the only way you can deal with weariness, you've you got to look to me. I will give you rest. I will deal with your weariness, and you won't become weary and give up. God said to us through Isaiah, do you not know? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is beyond anything we can, can grasp. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. So he, he knew it was hard. He, he didn't design life to be easy for anybody. It is hard. We're going to face things and deal with things that we don't feel we're capable of going through this. God knew that. So what did he provide? Here, let me help you carry that load. Let me, let me help you get back on track if you've gotten so weary you've fallen off. Let me come alongside of you and see that I'm going to strengthen you to make that next step in the process. Uh, how does this help us find our purpose in life? It encourages us to stay on the track even when we get so tired we can't take another step forward. Remember, the, the purpose is not the destination. This is a journey. We, we got a whole life to live to find out what it is God has called us to, what it is God wants from us. A journey, the process of moving something forward. For that journey, God promises the strength, the encouragement, the drive, the motivation, the target, and the goals that will get us there. What will be our reward? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. See, he, he's not only strengthened us for this, but he has so set us up that if we would just understand being called according to his purpose provides everything that we need for the success of this journey. He's guaranteed that. All things will work together for good to those that love the Lord. Here are takeaways. Number one, 
Life is a refining process to help shape us into that which identifies us as, Christ, as children of God. Life is a refining process that helps shape us into that which identifies us as children of God. Who we are now is a stepping stone to who we're to become. Always think of life as interlocking steps. Where I am now is not where I hope to be tomorrow. God will bring in a new step for me, and all he asks me to do, obey him and move forward. It's all I have to do. And within that new step, he carries me into something that's going to help more so uh, uh, explain who I am to be. Number three, when God sets the purpose, he also provides everything necessary to accomplish that purpose. Do you know when I, when I started out as, as a church kid, uh, I, I had no concept of the journey of life with the Lord. All I was committed to was showing up on Sunday, doing the things I was supposed to do, and I thought that was it. But then I found out, really, that's merely a means by which he calls me into a life. The life is what he's trying to get me to do. And the life is, uh, is the, 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 living the life is the responsibility he gives me. What he has done, though, he has provided everything I need for that life so that I can live that life. I'm not trying to make this stuff up. I'm just simply trying to follow the direction that he has set for me. Number four, thankfully, we never arrive because we always have more to which we can look forward to. We never arrive. Paul, Paul saying that, and you can't imagine him saying that, I have yet to, to accomplish what it is that God saved me for. I've yet to arrive at any destination where I can say, that's it, I'm done. All the way to the end, until the very moment that, that blade came down and took his head off, Paul was living out the purposes of God. Same for us. Number five, wherever we are in our journey, God's not done and has more for us to experience, discover, and enjoy. Doesn't matter where we are in life. It doesn't matter the number of the years that we've lived. Still more out there. God's not done. And really, that's the greatest encouragement for me to stay on track with him. I know he's got more ahead. All right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being the kind of God that knows us better than we know ourselves. And having purposes for us that go beyond anything we could ever define for ourselves or want for ourselves. Father, thank you that all you've asked us to do is obey you and then repent. Turn from any direction we're going that is not consistent with the direction you want us to go. And then the last thing you want us to do is just take the step that you give us each day. The next step of wherever we're to go in following after you. So, Father, give us the courage to do this. We realize that's probably what we need as much as anything. You've told us how. You've told us that we can receive from you everything we need. But, Father, some of us need the courage to be able to do so. So maybe that would be something that you would just infuse this whole congregation with. Courage to believe. Courage to trust. And Father, for those who have yet to make that decision to open their life to you and allow you that process of salvation whereby you take them as they are and turn them into the people you want them to be. Father, give them the courage to do that today as well. Father, that they might say yes to you and come into your family. Father, we thank you for loving us this much. In Jesus' name, amen. If today's your day for that, there'll be some folks down here, Ron and Dorcas, uh, uh, Glenda and uh, Leon down here to visit with you. If, you. if you'd like someone to talk about, I, I need to make sure that I've made that decision. They'll, they'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you about that and uh, kind of help you understand 
how much God loves you and what he wants for you. All right? Thanks for being here. Uh, I hope you have a, a great week coming. Uh, Jan and I, where would my wife go? Oh, there you are. She used, she used to be right there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're going to take a few days and uh, and go uh, east, young man. She has a conference that I'm being drugged. Uh, I'm being invited to, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go and uh, spend a few days uh, in Al- Atlanta. So uh, we'll be back before you know it. Uh, but uh, JJ is here with all that goes on. We got incredible elders that will help with whatever you need help. So realize you're covered. And just let the Lord take care of things. All right? God bless you. Thank you so much. Shout to the